Devon Hamilton gets the bag. And what will Wig do? Mail bag Wednesday here on Locked On Jaguars. You are Locked On Jaguars, your daily Jacksonville Jaguars podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you and welcome to another edition of Locked On Jaguars. I'm your host, Tony Wiggins, the host of the daily Locked On Jaguars podcast. We're at your team every day, and we thank you for making us your first listen. Quick reminder that we are free to subscribe to on the YouTube Locked On Jaguars page. Make sure you subscribe, like, do all of that good stuff. Hit the bell, check it out, all of that. Make sure you uh, tap into the YouTube page. It's a lot of fun. Also, wherever you get your podcast. Uh, if you listen to audio, make sure you check in wherever that is to make sure you do not miss an episode. What's going on to my everydayers out there? We got a good show for you today. We're going to talk to Von Hamilton getting a bag, something I had mentioned months ago that I would hope happened. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I brought it up back then. We'll get into that, but he is going to man the middle. Uh, that sounds like a Michael Jackson song. He's going to man the middle of that defense for the foreseeable future. So the draft, develop, and retain portion of the jaguars is underway also where are the jaguars most vulnerable we're going to look at that uh i brought that up because i actually did a little bit of a mailbag that we're going to get into in um segment three and i'm laughing at some of the questions uh it's called ask wig wednesday i'm going to try to do that every single week for you it just has it rolls off my tongue pretty good and it has a pretty good uh ring to it so the question in segment two is where are they most vulnerable that question actually came up so I decided to give it an entire segment by itself. But in the segment three, I'm going to still answer some of those wild questions. Man, y'all crazy, man. I'm telling you. Uh, first and foremost, though, nose tackle Devon Hamilton gets a three-year extension worth between $34.5 and $36 million. 18.7 of that will be in the first year. Good for him. I'm all about guys getting a bag. I've always liked him as a player. I wondered what he would be like as a pro when he came out. They have actually done a real good job over two staffs developing him into someone that even though he's a run stuffer and he's a big physical six foot four, 325 pound guy, he actually does get pressure up the middle. So I've seen him chase plays down field. So he's not a fat dude. He's not sloppy. When you see him, he's just built like a, a tall soda machine. Right. So um, quick behind the scenes a little bit there were a couple of times at practice over the last few years where i'm standing next to either visitors or former coaches or some combination of both people that you know that have been around the nfl for a long time and i recall on multiple occasions guys saying god look at him about two guys one of them was about cam robinson but the most i've ever heard it about was devon hamilton when former coaches from other teams come in visiting former college announcers maybe about 10 times when you have seen them just go damn one of them was for Trayvon Walker because they saw him close up and didn't realize how long his arms were but I would say three times it's been for Cam Robinson and about six times it's been for Devon Hamilton that's how when you see him you go woo that's what an NFL defensive tackle who needs to get an extension looks like so I'm glad they did it I think he's a good player. I think it's it, it's a good start and a beginning to them retaining the guys that they that they like very much. Um, of course, I wish they'd have done it a year earlier with somebody else, but they didn't. But this is where it starts. You get enough guys like this, you start to build that continuity. You know exactly what it is that you're getting. Guys like 25 years old, that's the best the career, got the best years ahead of him, and you get ahead of it and don't let him get to the market. Trust me, he gets to the market. He gets more than $36 million over three years next year. But you don't even want him to gamble on injury. You put a lot of money up in the kid's face and say, here, you take this. And that's exactly what he did. So $18.7 million his first year. The important thing is for the next for, for the foreseeable future, he is the interior lineman. Sometimes they line him up and move him around a little bit. But he, he he's the bully. He's going to be the bully and, and the, uh, the enforcer along that Jaguars defensive line. So it's a very good thing to happen. Okay, what does that mean? Does it mean that does it mean that 
they're done with the defensive line. I think for the most part, yeah, because when you add in the fact that they have Foley Fadokazi, who has a big number, and they extended him. So that means whenever you see a guy get an extension, that means nine times out of ten, he's going to be here longer than the following season, at least another year, because you know you don't want to push money down the road for production that you're not getting. Um, Foley uh, re-upped, so that's two guys. <clears throat> I think Foley goes 310, 315. I think Devon goes – I don't want him to get mad at me. I, I'll say 325, but I think it's closer to 330, 335. But in any event, big guy that doesn't uh, get pushed around, what the Jaguars are, are faced with now is just adding depth behind those guys because in this hot sun, and it's always hot, and it ain't like other cities, you have a game here in November and it'll be 80 degrees outside. The thing is, is guys can get worn down, especially when you have an offense that scores quickly and you don't want – people on the field if you're playing a high octane game against another really really good playoff team or someone that can keep up with you or at the very least someone that's going to try to be aggressive right along with you and that means a lot of incomplete passes and uh, uh, clocks being stopped where there's a lot of plays run it's cool to have good starters but it's better to have it's it's better to have those starters with you know a couple of guys backups are going to be backups but at least depth guys who the, the the more they play, the worse they get, but the less they play, the more effective they are. Get guys that can give you something 20% of the time to get these bigger guys some rest, especially when, like I said, you're in a shootout or you're playing against a scrambling quarterback and they're running around. How many times have you seen them run around, run around, run around, chase a guy, incomplete pass, but now they're gassed. And the next play is a draw up the middle and the dude goes for 20. That happens because guys are worn down and tired. So, Good move for the Jaguars. I think uh, this really, really helps the interior of the, defense, the defensive line along with the additions of uh, Mr. Lacey, who they picked in the draft, a couple of guys that they added in free agency. And we'll see with the veteran free agency market if somebody is out there that wants to play for a playoff contender. Last year, you saw the Eagles. Even though they didn't win the Super Bowl, they grabbed two guys uh, right at in Damakong Sioux and then uh, Joseph, Linville Joseph. They went and got those guys to make that bit of a run. So the Jags are in that territory. They're in that kind of territory where you're going to have dudes that are sitting around that don't think it's worth it to come in for 1.5 or 2 million bucks unless they're going to get a Super Bowl at this point in their career. So uh, this allows them to sit in that little area and say, look, now we got enough people, but we kind of might need another big guy to make a run. So maybe they can now go and spend a little bit of money and grab someone because everyone sees this as a playoff team. I'm going to tell you where the Jags are super, super vulnerable. I don't believe it's that defensive tackle, um, but there are some positions out there. I do believe that they uh, can fortify a little bit and we'll do that. We'll talk about it all here in just a second on Locked on Jaguars after I tell you about today's sponsor, and that is FanDuel. I need you to make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA Finals. These games have gotten off to a real good start, and you have some all-time greats showing up in the playoffs at actually delivering. FanDuel right now gives new customers a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your bet doesn't win. That's right. You better bet on AD and KD and all of these guys with initials. The old-timers are showing up and showing out, and you can have a chance, but you got to go on FanDuel to get all of your information first before laying down your wager because there's no better bet bet or place to make a bet for all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on FanDuel official sports betting partner of the NBA. And we welcome you back here, making us your first listen on Locked On Jaguars. Hope that you're an everyday. If you are, salute to you. If you're not, if you're a newcomer, welcome. Thank you. You're uh, allowed to come in and sit down and chill and interact just like everyone else. Drop a comment down, hit the like button, come back tomorrow, and you won't be a new person anymore. Um, so a lot of people asked, where are the vulnerabilities for the Jaguars? The vulnerabilities... Um, meaning areas that they probably need to show up before the draft or someone framed it like if you were an opponent of the Jaguars, where would you attack them? And that's a really, really good question. But it's one that I think I have the answer to. 
So I look at this twofold, right? When the Jaguars are on offense, where am I going to attack them? I'm going to try to attack the edge. I, you know, I'm going to see if they can block us. I'm going to see if they can block my defensive ends. Now, there's a difference. Every team in the league has someone that if you stick to average or has a couple of guys that if you stick to average guys on the edge of the offensive line without chipping, without helping, I think every team in the league has uh, one or two guys that can get one and a half, two sacks a game, including Jacksonville. If you if you stick average guys, average guys on Trayvon Walker and on Josh Allen, you're going to have a long day. If you have a pretty good player, then now it becomes a little bit more even. And, and that's and that's relative across the league. But one thing every team has, I believe, I think every single team has somebody that can wreck your Sunday if you're not playing well at offensive tackle. So I believe the first thing that's going to happen is teams are going to see, can they block? I think the Jaguars drops are going to be a little bit longer this year because they have more downfield weapons. Why have five and seven step drops when you don't necessarily have people that are going to really uh, kill the defense deep unless you get them used to killing them early and then you get guys sucking up and now you can catch them late. But I think the Jaguars by design will try to test the ball more downfield, especially down the middle of the field this year. And, uh, because of the tougher schedule, they're going to have to produce more on offense. It's not going to be just about them being able to matriculate the ball or find a way to to score some points by dinking and dunking. I, I really think when you're trying to win a championship and once you've established yourself, your ability to get the ball down the field and score points and score them quickly and score them in abundance is going to be huge. So the first thing I do is I see if they can pass block. The second thing I do is I see if they can run block on the edges, especially if I can try to contain the edge and keep everybody i'd see if my ends are better at their tackles than 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 allowing things to get outside because they now have speed galore when you talk about they already had good speed but now you're talking about ridley maybe on the jet sweep you're talking about jamal agnew on something quick of course uh travis etn and now tank bigsby i really think you're going to see the jaguars really try to use everything instead of just a lot of the quick hitters and uh, some of the slashing running plays so the test is going to be, uh, can you make them impatient? Can can you can you shut them down enough to the point where they have to take more chances down the field, which exposes Trevor Lawrence to more of a pass rush, all right? So that means there's not a lot of weaknesses in terms of how you deal with them. How do you attack them if you're the opponent? And the, them and this is the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, I try to run the ball. I see if they can uh, effectively if, uh, stop the run. Uh, which they did a lot last year. The thing is, is though, even though they fortified, you know, with the extension and uh, added a couple of pieces in free agency in the draft, I'd still see if, if they got it right. I'd see if they, if they want to be, um, if they want to be a team that can, that can take somebody punching them in the stomach. But that's just my overall philosophy for most NFL teams, right? When it comes to the Jaguars specifically, there are things that I saw last year that I want to see if they've improved on them. And what that is, is guarding your third receiver in the slot, guarding your tight end when he's a dynamic pass catcher, guarding running backs and wide receivers, especially big receivers on shallow crosses, waggles, and drag routes, because they did not, in my opinion, maybe, maybe film says something different, but I don't think they did a good job last year of guarding people when they cross their faces and what i mean by that is in between the levels in between the line of scrimmage and the linebackers and in between the linebackers and the safeties when people ran across the field other than those few times you saw andre cisco almost decapitate someone i thought they were chasing a little bit on those routes and if you guys remember, the, the biggest game that happened it was against the Colts. That, that was a really, really bad game. And the game where they kind of got ran on was the game at home that they lost against the Houston Texans. I have to remind everybody, even though the Texans were the worst team in the league record-wise, well, second the worst team in the league record-wise, they they lost – that the Jaguars lost to them. And under, any circum, under no circumstances should you ever lose to a team like that. So you just have to be careful – with the game management portion of it. The biggest thing too that I the, the biggest thing I need to mention on defense is I'd come out and I'd find Tyson Campbell if I'm the other quarterback. And then I look to the other way and I'll be like, hey new friend, how you doing? It's gonna be a long day. They have to prove that Darius Williams 
or whoever can guard wide receivers who are legitimate guys who can eat up the route tree and guys who will first down you to death and even touch down you to death on double moves. They have to shore that up. Um, they realized that Shaq Griffin wasn't the answer, and then he got hurt, I think, and he didn't play anymore. But, yeah, that, that would be something that, in my opinion, would would be um, – would be challenging now with with their schedule they don't have a lot of people that are going to come out here and just going to try to attack their weaknesses and hope that that's going to get them the victory they're going to play a lot of people that's just going to play to their strengths when you look at these playoff teams that they have when you look at cincinnati and kc and the 49ers those teams know exactly who they are and who they want to be every single week now will they attack you yeah They'll attack you. Uh, is Joe Burrow going to throw to Jamar Chase and T. Higgins? you damn right he's going to throw to both of them, regardless of who's guarding him. So that is, is an obvious thing. It's like when teams are able to do a little bit of both. If and, t- if and when teams are able to do a little bit of both, if they can play to their strengths, but then still circle guys that they want to pinpoint and go after. Like, for instance, if you play the 49ers, you know what they're going to do. They're going to scheme you up. They're going to misdirection. It's They're going to have one cut runs and they're going to have a lot of play action and rollouts and they're going to hit guys with quick passes and they're going to hit guys all over the field in the flat, in the seam. They're going to attack everything. They're going to go deep with IU. They're going to get Debo Samuel one-on-one on on the outside, all of that stuff. So against a team like that, it's imperative that the Jaguars tackle very well. They have to tackle in the open field. They can't miss tackles and give up first downs against a good team. So that will be, in my opinion, the vulnerability that they face is some of the, they got to prove some of the things that, that that hurt them last year that they won't let them hurt them this year that they've actually gotten better. I will say though that the trickiest part of this team coming out of training camp is going to be the offensive line, and that's because of the new people, rookie combined with uh, likely suspension combined with the fact that you have guys that's not quite healthy yet that won't be right in Brent, like Ben Barch. Uh, you know, is Luke Fortner, the center, going to get stronger? Um, what are they going to look like when they come out of camp? And then what are they going to look like when Cam Robinson comes back? All of that moving around kind of interrupts the continuity and the flow because you ain't going to have a guy work with $22 million cap hit sitting on the sideline. So all of that stuff is going to be very, very imperative to how far this team goes. And I'm going to sit right here for a minute before I uh, get to the third segment. I'm going to sit right here and I'm going to let you know. For four years, I argued with people about the Jaguars' offensive line. Four. Over the last two or three years, they've made – now, even though you can say this year they were just trying to replace somebody who left, they have made absolute strides in trying to add more to the offensive line because it's not good enough just to be fine or it's not good enough just to be okay. If you want to be a championship team with or without a championship quarterback or or franchise quarterback – that offensive line has to be fixed. Now, this is coming from a guy who always believed you never took him in the first round and who always believed that um, you, you get guys that score touchdowns and guys who stop guys from scoring touchdowns. But, you know, when you get older, you get wiser. And it has been beat into my head. There is no way a team is going to make it close to winning a championship if they don't have a really, really good to great offensive line. So I'm glad that the Jaguars are – year by year investing in it and i wanted them to invest in it but i wanted them to keep juan taylor and continue to invest in the line but they see the importance of it and they understand it and now they're doing things the way a championship football team does hopefully uh the picks that they have will work out we'll do it all more here in just a second in segment three we'll get to your questions here on locked on jaguar all right i took a brave, brave stance to ask what Ask Wig Wednesday here in the mailbag. And I got so many questions. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. Bear with me if I don't face you and if I'm not looking in the camera here on YouTube because I'm trying to look down at these questions because I don't want to come off of my screen on YouTube. Um, I'm going to get to some of these questions. One of them asked me, one of them, I want to mention it by name first. I want to, I want to go through it by name because they were really, really funny. 
uh, well, somebody, uh, Trevorville and someone else asked me, will Jordan Smith make the 53? Don't know. I think he will. I honestly do. I think they, I think he, there's a lot there. And uh, I think he makes it. And if he doesn't make it, he, they, may, they may practice squad him. But I don't think he'll stick on the practice squad. I think somebody will get him. Joshua Wright asked me, mustard or ketchup? Um, not a football question, but uh, I would say mustard. Ketchup has too much high fructose corn syrup in it. But it tastes better than, than mustard. But everything that I eat ketchup on, I can do without ketchup on it. I've done it. So, you know, the things that I like mustard on, like, brats and sausages and hot dog I, I need mustard on those things so i would say mu uh, mustard um someone uh fire balky asked me fire balky asked me a question about trent balky he said what do you think was the biggest factor in balky selecting a lot of players that didn't have superior measurables and traits for example i was sure they'd take deontay banks uh, but they traded down instead. Look, I thought they were going to take Deontay Banks, uh, but they didn't. Uh, but they did take a guy with measurables instead of taking him when they took Anton Harrison. Anton Harrison has measurables too. Later in the draft, they took guys without measurables. Because they failed to trade up 15 or 16 times, they then went for production, in my opinion, over those measurables. And I mentioned that yesterday, that it was good to see him come off of uh, doing that. Um Bowtie Pizza Man asks, what group needs to step up this season or next in order for us to reach the promised land, the offensive line, and the pass rush in the trenches, I think, is very, very important. Uh, Cody Hutchinson, do you think of any late rounders that will make a big impact and become a player everyone loves? Cody, that's a good question, but I'm going to leave it because then I don't want to be cheering for one guy and um, not really – because when it comes to those guys, I, I do what my pastor told me once, leave room for the Holy Spirit. I mean, I ain't getting all sermon on y'all, but and what that means is I want to leave room to watch it without actually cheering for one person. I don't know enough about the undrafted free agents. Uh, obviously, there's a kid from Jacksonville. I root for the home kid to make his team. But the thing is, is I'm looking for all of them to fight. You know, I'm looking for all of them to fight because they're all in a fight because this roster is really set with commitments and it's going to be very hard to crack that code. So if uh, someone does, then great. I'll be watching them and rooting for them. Uh, Nick asks Evan Ingram, do you see him getting a long term deal done or will he play on the tag this season? And how could that deal affect all the contracts we have to do next season? I think he needs to sign a long term deal. If he doesn't. Here's what might happen. Here's what I definitely know is going to happen. His stats are going to drop. Sign it while you're hot because after this year, your numbers aren't – unless people don't pay attention to numbers, they just play, pay attention to success and, and how you play. His numbers are going to drop this year. And the reason why his numbers are going to drop because they have Calvin Ridley. They have Calvin Ridley. They got Tank Bigsby. And then they drafted a tight end in the second round who they're going to use all over the place. So it's, it's inevitable that his numbers are not going to look as good. If he had career numbers last year, so did – everybody else all the receivers they ain't gonna do that next year because calvin ridley should lead this team in in, in catches and yards he should be the only one that has a thousand yards receiving next year uh kirk kirk can be close and then somebody asked me this question i love to mention names while i'm on it if i come to the question i'll mention your name do i think parker washington gets marvin jones's reps yeah that's it that's what he's gonna get and because what's going to happen is Zay Jones will be the third receiver. Anytime they go to two tight ends, Zay Jones might be the guy that's not in the game because they need Kirk and they need Ridley in the game. I mean, in some situations you might have it, but I think first swing at two tight ends means you're going to have those two guys in and, and, and Zay is the third guy. So Zay is essentially a Marvin Jones and Parker Washington is the guy that's learning behind them. Parker Washington is going to be this. Parker Washington is going to learn behind those three. And when one of those three is out or one of those three is cut or they move on from them because one of those three is either old in the tooth or he's not worth what they're paying him, then Parker Washington is going to be the dude they hope to plug in. Remember, draft, develop, retain, and be the third receiver on this team. Four years from now, they probably hope he's the number two. That's just the way that it goes. Um and a lot of that can be helped if Parker Washington comes in and plays really, really well. Shea Ellers or Shea Eilers asked me uh, my thoughts on the running back room. I love it. I love it. 
I knew Doug was going to eventually get to the point where he wanted two real bell cow types, two front line, two guys that can start in the league regardless of the team, and then have a third guy that could also give them something if they need it, the way he did in Philly, the way Philly did last year. And that is exactly what he has now with Bigsby to go along with Travis Etienne. Uh, John Lumpkin asked me, does Braswell make the 53? Don't know, but I'll be pulling for him and I'll be rooting for him. Bear Force One, will Little Cam or Harrison end up playing guard at some point? Yes. Yes. Who? Little. Little's going to play guard. And I wanted to say this about uh, uh, Walker Little. I'm rooting for Walker Little. I really am. But there are some people that have framed Walker Little's uh, tenure here as this, that he's just great, right? Because he can play right guard, right tackle, left tackle. He can play left guard because Doug says he can kick inside. And then when they didn't retain Juwan Taylor, well, they didn't because they knew they had Walker. No, they tried to retain Juwan Taylor. They offered Juwan Taylor a good deal. He just took a better one to leave. So let's slow down on the walk a little slander, but let's also slow down on putting him in Canton because everyone knows that he can move around. There's never been a real good offensive lineman that has been kept on the bench behind average offensive linemen. And that has been, has not, has been so good that you don't implant him. He could, if he's that good, he would have played in front of Tyler Shatley and Ben March last year. That's all I'm telling you. It wouldn't have taken an injury to get him on the field. People are literally acting like he's an all pro. And, and I don't know that he's not, but I but I don't think anybody can definitively say he is. So it, it's it's just a little bit wild to me that everyone automatically assumes that Walker Little is just way better than all of us think he really is. And that's not it. They they tried to ret- keep the other guy and then they tailor and then they drafted another tackle in the first round. I don't think they do that if Walker Little is as good as y'all think he is. Uh, Susanna Harrison says if the Jags could have a mulligan on the first wave of free agency this year, knowing what would happen with Cam in the draft, do you think they would have handled it? Yeah, they would have handled it different. I think if they knew Cam was suspended, they probably would have paid Jawan more. That's it. I think they definitely would have handled it differently. Or they would have gone out and, and at least gotten a, a 4 or $5 million option to play to tackle you know it's too much riding on this season you can't be about hope and optimism right now and and you you know they you you, you're too close and and there's too much riding on this season with a tougher schedule ethan cador with the addition of miller do you think he could potentially fill the backup mike role uh he's talking about the rookie from florida and uh yeah i do and i think that they do as well I think they've seen what they need to see with Shaquille it was Shaq Griffin. Not that they're going to cut him, not that he doesn't have a place, but that, you know, he's not good enough for us to not go take a look at Ventrell. And I just think Ventrell, um, Ventrell won him over too. So a lot of that has to do with him and not has to do with need. I'm going to get to a few more here. Do you think Parker Washington will take? Okay, I already did that. So the person who asked that question was General of Duval. Jackson DeVille says, does not get in a pass rusher early, make it more likely that Josh Allen gets a new contract in Jax. I don't think that that's ind- in- indicative of it all. I just think that they couldn't take everything. They couldn't take everything. They got a guy on the roster right now who's a starter on his fifth-year option. If they have to worry about it, they'll get it They'll get it done next year. They need him to play good, and they need Trayvon Walker to uh, move forward and then someone else to emerge behind him. Um Lamo, what are the wide receiver stats? And I'm not doing stats, man. I don't know who's going to average. Well, I just think, I think, um, I think Calvin really should have more stats and more numbers than anybody. Uh, who man, who asks, is there a chance the Jags improve, but it really doesn't show in the standings? Yes, absolutely. I'm not going to give a prediction yet on their record. But I have said in the past, they could actually be a better team with a worse record or the same record. Um, hashtag DTWD Duval Tubi Dot J Rand asks, in my opinion, who would be the Jag starting offensive lineman if they played today? Uh, Harrison at right tackle, even though I think eventually he's the left tackle of the future. Walker Little 
at left tackle. Um, Tyler Shatley at guard. Brandon Sheriff at guard. And then Luke Fortner at center. I think that that's the way that they go. Who's my favorite Jaguar quarterback out of the franchise and why? It's Trevor Lawrence. I don't have to tell you why. Football junkie. Football stock junkie. That's it. That's it. Okay, man. So we've gone through most of these questions here. Um, we did the best I could to answer them all. Somebody asked me if they should get a Jaguars tattoo. Yeah, by all means, do it. Um, just don't put any uh, dates and Super Bowl champion stuff on it. And then someone asked me, finally, because of the barber in me, they're getting gray hair. Should they dye it or rock the gray? Uh, from a guy that does both, I rock the gray, but I accent where it's still dark. Like you see the thick black stripe here on the inside of my beard. And if you see some of the rubble on YouTube on my face, I think people think I do this on purpose. But if you really see it, I can't because I shave my face. So I have a gray streak right in the middle of my beard. So when I grow my beard, it's black on top and black on the bottom with a gray streak in the middle. And I have a black streak in my goatee. Those are natural. Those are natural. So I enhance them. Sometimes they're a little more black than normal. So you really see the line of demarcation. But if you're looking right here on YouTube, you can see that I got a little raccoon thing going on. But I like it because my wife likes it and it makes me look like the most interesting man in the world. You can be the most interesting person in the world, too. All you got to do is just stick around on Locked On Jaguars to learn everything uh, about the team every single day that we know because it's your team every day. Make us your first listen. Second listen, I'm going to tell you what's going on in the future. I am going to attempt to get in touch with our my Locked On counterparts who cover the colleges where your draft picks came from so you can learn a little bit more about them. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to reach out. They're going to be available. If I don't get it done this week, we'll certainly start that series next week. But you guys, make sure you tap in every single day on YouTube or on audio, wherever you get your podcast, because it's your team every day. And we always thank you for making us your first listen. Take care of each other, and we'll see you tomorrow.